everybody to our first session of our week-long Sizzlin' Summer webinar series. So today's session is all about data management. And of course, everybody knows the implications your data management strategy has on your company's overall reporting and analytics capabilities. And particularly, Treasury and Finance, you know, these departments are both the owners of quite a bit of critical data, your bank data, your balance of transaction data, GL information, but they're also the users of quite a bit of data that's produced from other departments as well, such as AP, AR, and FP&A. So more and more, we're getting, coming across a lot of questions from companies who are looking to understand some of the modern strategies, how to bring all this data together to more efficiently fuel their analytics strategies. And so we thought we'd take today's session to do exactly that. Uh, before we jump into today's conversation, just want to introduce my co-speaker here, Florian Gessner, who's the CTO of TIS. Florian, maybe you could take a minute here uh, to introduce yourself as well. Yeah, thank you very much, Sean. It's a pleasure to be here on the webinar today. Um, I'm CTO of TIS. I'm with TIS now for more than 11 years. I have background with SAP software development, uh, as well as architecting large-scale applications, and I'm happy to discuss this very interesting topic today with you. All right, great. Thanks. Thanks, Florian. I mean, we could start here with a very sort of basic introductory type question. We're talking about these, you know, modernized data management strategies. What exactly do we mean by that? What sorts of strategies are modern organizations putting in place today? How do they compare to legacy strategies and what sorts of, you know, um, issues and problems and, you know, inefficiencies are they looking to solve by moving to these strategies? Yeah, I think if we talk about data management and strategies, we first of all have to understand which historical challenges do we want to solve? And typically in the past, we work with data warehouses where we had the challenge that we work with pre-aggregated data. And if we wanted to dive deeper or make different decisions, we had the issue that data was aggregated and we didn't have access to the raw data to derive new data sets based on the, the initial data. And uh, a foundation here is the technology and technology evolution we saw over the last couple of years. It starts with cloud, so it's important to have a cloud strategy in place to make use of either the major cloud providers or purpose-built solutions such as Snowflake and implement data lakes or data mesh which allow you to store uh, this vast amount of data at scale. Um, but also within a certain boundaries, because at the end, it's also important to make sure that you have control over the data and that you make sure that security and privacy is addressed in the first place. So technology builds the foundation and, and this needs to be combined with, with data governance. So I, I already mentioned security and compliance, but data governance needs to go beyond this. So you have to really understand where and how you collect data, where you store data, uh, how data is accessed and how data is used in the organization and across the organization because you often also interact with partners. Uh, so you really have to understand where the data resides and how it is used. And here also break down data silos and make data available so that you can really make use of it. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I think um, you picked up a really yeah. key term there in terms of data being the foundation of it all, right? So you can't run good analytics unless you have a foundation of good data. Everybody knows garbage in, garbage out. So if you're pulling, you know, say for a forecasting solution, pulling information from multiple different sources and there's some limitations to what data you can access, your forecast is only gonna be as good as the data that has to support it, right? So is that kind of what companies are looking to solve for here to bring this all together and just make it more universally accessible and standardized for those purposes? Exactly. And, and that's also one of the reasons why the companies also adopt methodologies such as data ops. This goes into the same direction as companies adopted to DevOps in the past, so shifting left operational aspects into the development teams. The same is now happening with data, shifting left data management and uh, data science into the development teams to gain better collaboration, a better management and understanding of data and and with this ensure that you can develop and iteratively uh, develop data solutions consistently and with this bring value to the customers yeah it makes a lot of sense it, and that, i think you brought up another good point there in terms of data kind of getting stuck in silos historically when companies don't have a really good data management strategy so you might have a bunch of 
legacy systems hosted on-prem uh, where the data is kind of sitting on that same sort of server, multiple geographies, multiple different systems, multiple different business lines, but then more at a company level, you're trying to roll that data up and get a high level analytical view over the entire activity of the company from a banking transaction, forecasting, whatever it might be perspective. And companies can't do it, right? They can only access what they have access to. So yeah, I think historically we've seen this manifest itself for some companies and you know things like long time to create a cash forecast, a lot of time spent on just trying to bring in data, standardized data, integrate it into a TMS or even bring it all into Excel so that it can all be analyzed holistically. We've even seen companies experience basic problems around just you know kind of trying to evaluate their supplier and customer relations where they're trying to look across multiple different systems, data silos to understand you know the terms they have with their suppliers or customers are those kind of synchronized universally across the entire organization that has a lot of impact as well on just you know general working capital and cash flow and things like that for companies so yeah it seems like that's really what companies are trying to um, aim for here they know that it's not just about report generation obviously a lot of companies are talking about real-time analytics these days real-time uh insights and you can't do that really without a good strategy to bring all that data together holistically and then running some sort of a software or analytics solution kind of on top of that as well, right? So, Exactly. And it, it becomes more interesting even if you can combine the data with d data you get from partners from the public internet and, and bring all this data together to, to go deeper and make more sense out of your data. Yeah, that's a good point. Real-time strategies don't just mean real-time bank data, but real-time data from a lot of different sources as well to be able to drive the level of insights that companies want to. So something to definitely think about here. Um, you know, I, it seems like a lot of, um, you know, one big point that seems to have really accelerated data strategies for organizations or advances in APIs that companies have used for integration purposes, as well as cloud computing technology, right, in ways that weren't previously possible. So it was kind of a game changer for data accessibility where previously, you know, we talked about before, maybe data was kind of trapped in these silos due to these on-premise hosting models. And now these applications are going up into the cloud. Data is becoming more universally accessible for a lot of different purposes, for a lot of different applications to be able to access. Um, you can even see this a lot in sort of the cloud ERP migrations that are going on these days, where previously maybe you had to maintain multiple instances of the same ERP system on-prem due to the way that your IT infrastructure was was kind of set up, right? And now you can go to one cloud-hosted model, and for a lot of companies, that's the first time they've been able to go on one ERP system across the entire company. That's a game changer in terms of data accessibility, in terms of process standardization globally within, within the company as well, too. So maybe we could talk a little bit about just how APIs and cloud computing technology have really sort of accelerated some of these data management strategies. Yeah, for sure. This is a very good one. So APIs in general are a game changer for integrations because you can seamlessly integrate systems with each other. And you have a standardized service interface, often REST-based interfaces or GraphQL or so. And this is a major difference to the part where, the past where you usually work with proprietary protocols or even don't have an an extension point where you could plug in into your system and, and here APIs build the foundation for integrations and the, the cloud on the other hand makes technology and especially for data data services available for small medium-sized companies to the same uh, extent as large corporates were able to to manage um, this uh, is related to different data storage technologies built for different purposes, which in the past only the large corporates were able to, to manage. They had all the DBAs caring about relational databases, large scale data warehouses, and, and with the cloud and the shared responsibility model, even small company is nowadays able to, to build large scale data platforms cost effectively and maintain and run them 24 seven. And this is, I think, one of the important uh, things which changed the system completely. And this is even connected with enhanced security and uh, compliance capabilities. So the, the security measures and features provided 
on the large uh, hyperscaler cloud such as AWS, GCP or Azure make a major difference to how you manage data in the past on-premise where you didn't have the capabilities of such fine-grained access control or even attribute-based access control to data. And this is another important aspect for, for storing data, especially finance data, securely in, in, in such an environment. Yeah, it's certainly simplified the uh, infrastructures companies have to maintain to sort of employ one of these data management strategies. And like you mentioned, good point, it even is accessible to small companies now, not just the biggest players who have the most resources in the world to be able to kind of put in place these uh, more complex or sophisticated data management strategies. You know, but let's say you take, you know, you start to employ some of these technologies. So cloud technology, obviously, and the efficiencies from processing power architecture, you know, on, on a go forward basis that, that that provides. Data lakes, being able to kind of standardize, combine, simplify data for analytical purposes. APIs to, you know, kind of be able to synchronize this information between multiple different applications in a more granular way, right? Does this kind of solve all problems for organizations from the perspective of their data management strategies, or there's still kind of some issues that persist beyond this, or even just some basic considerations companies should uh, should kind of keep in mind? Yeah, so basically these services provide you a, a toolbox, how you can implement your data strategy, how you can implement your data platform. Uh, but you still have to solve challenges such as inconsistent data formats, inconsistent data structures, incomplete data, and, and also data from legacy systems where data ingestion is still complex or hard to solve. And these uh, modern platforms allow you usually to build very flexible data pipelines, which allow you to ingest or import data from various sources and through data preparation steps you can prepare and clean data to bring them into a consistent uh, format adopt them for analytics purposes and even extend or complete data uh, based on uh, strategies such as data imputation where you enrich data with uh, data pr uh, from certain sources you have at hand in your ecosystem or using machine learning algorithms to to extend data or complete data based on uh, some heuristics or machine learning mm -hmm. and make... even for legacy yeah oh, even sorry, for dude. legacy systems there are options provided to to integrate with them um, through apis migration strategies the large-scale cloud solutions even provide uh, solutions uh, for such issues. Mm. Yeah, so it's still important to figure out how to get the data from its source, from its original source, into the data lake, right? And that you're kind of subject to whatever capabilities the systems have. Probably in terms of you know how, how good of a job the organization's done historically, kind of storing that legacy information that you might need because you kind of need some sort of a runway of data, a few years worth of data to kind of make total use of it in, in all situations. And you're probably a little bit more in control of this, I guess, if you're talking about your own data that you've been storing historically or gonna, or gonna pull histor uh, on a go forward basis internally, but you're probably also bringing in external data as well from things like banking partners. And then you probably have some considerations such as, you know, what are their capabilities? There are banks out there that can obviously provide data real time or at least intraday. Um, but other banks don't have those same capabilities and you know don't even provide data in an automated way. It needs to be pulled more manually and ingested into the data lake that way. So I guess you always do kind of have that consideration of um, how the data is ultimately going to get in there. And then I guess once you have it in there, you also have to figure out, you know, am I collecting the right data, right? And uh, how am I ultimately going to use it here? So uh, that's kind of like the net, because obviously the whole purpose of these strategies is to fuel better analytics or business processes internally. So from that perspective, you know, I guess is all data val valuable? Should a company just store as much data as they as they have access to, kind of indefinitely, or is it worth going through some sort of almost data valuation exercise to understand what types of data your company uses, and you know, how much of a duration of that data you need to store? What are the really the key attributes of that data that you need for analytics purposes on a day or day basis? Yeah, no, for sure not. So storing all data is doesn't fit the purpose so not all data is equally important and harvesting all kind of data also implies security and privacy risks 
And then you also have to keep in mind, even data, if data and storage prices um, uh, drop year by year, it's still not for free. And uh, with uh, modern data lakes, uh, you usually store raw data as it is, um, but you still need to be clear about is the data relevant to um, solve a business goal or objective? You need to understand the format and if the format can be used and can be analyzed. You need to understand if the data is maybe unique or difficult to obtain and with this give you a competitive advantage over, um, over other companies, which is a, uh, would be a very good sign to store such data. Uh, how accurate is your data uh, or is it uh, inaccurate uh, trash? And also important is how timely is the data? Uh, is it recent data versus old data? Is old data worth to store or is it coming outdated and with this uh, not worth to, to store any longer? And, and this also co is connected with regulatory requirements. So partly you are not allowed to store data forever, especially considering data privacy frameworks such as GDPR. And with this, it's important that you have a robust data governance framework in place uh, with data classification and cataloging tools to understand where is your data and how do you use the data. Yeah, it makes sense. The um... Yeah, it seems like too much data could potentially obscure things a bit where, you know, if you, if you look at Treasury, they probably know kind of more or less exactly what they would like to have for data sets to be able to fuel processes like their forecasting process, you know, their bank data, APAR data, FP&A data, other data they might use to drive, you know, business specific for, forecast variables. So from that perspective, when you go through this sort of data valuation exercise, do you think companies are doing it kind of hand in hand, you know, the business owners? really working in conjunction with the IT people and the individuals who are kind of orchestrating the overall data management strategy? Like, is it important to have, kind of have that tie in between those two departments, do you think? Yeah, for sure. So it's important to bring them together and with this understand what are our objectives and the goals we want to achieve. And th therefore you need to connect the people from the business with the data analysts, the data scientists and the engineering team. So this is uh, of at the most importance, otherwise you store whatever data and you can't make use out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so although technology is making this simpler, there's still a lot of components here to consider in terms of what data, what source systems it's coming from, how to normalize that data, how to actually use it for business purposes, right? And then you know, another kind of complicated uh, aspect of this that you kind of alluded to during the response to the last question is the uh, is what data are you allowed to store based on certain regulations like data privacy regulations, GDPR, for example, in the EU. Uh, in the US, data privacy is a little bit more, more lax, but there's special regulations for California. And it seems like you know more and more US, US uh, states are starting to get more up to speed about data privacy for, uh, for companies and particularly for individuals, right? Um, so from that perspective, how do you, or can you think of any sort of strategies organizations can use to overcome some of these data privacy considerations to make sure that they're being compliant when they do uh, store their data? Yeah, for sure. So as you mentioned, GDPR still is kind of the benchmark in the market regarding data privacy. Uh, we, we all see the trends coming uh, uh, that new privacy acts arise in the, especially in the US, but all of them together, it, or for all of them together, it's important that you understand the framework and understand what really um, needs to be done to be compliant. And from there, start to implement data mapping and cl classification to understand what data is processed and stored, where is the data processed and stored, and who has access. And based on this, you have to establish a strong data governance where you implement rules and procedures for data collection, storage, use, deletion, and access control. And this all starts with implementing privacy by design. So that means that in the early phase of your development process, you already have to understand where is the data used to implement the privacy controls early in the, uh, in, in the early implementation phase. And overall, 
And this is also one of the requirements coming from GDPR. Minimizing data collection is key. Come, this goes hand in hand what we talked before. So it's not worth to store as much data as possible. You need to store the data which is relevant and minimize data collection to stay in line with the data privacy regulations. And this also uh, you can only achieve with an awareness. So you need to train your employees and you need to make them aware of data privacy on a regular basis. This is the foundation. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you don't want to store data just for the sake of storing data if ultimately you're not using it. And it might put you in the purview of certain regulations to store it to begin with, right? That's sort of a, a worst case scenario there for data management strategies. And in a lot of markets, you know, you can store this information, but you can't transfer it into another jurisdiction that's not under the same regulations as where the data originally was stored, right? So is there any way companies can solve that this, these days? You know, do they just sort of opt for the most strict jurisdiction and kind of store all the data there or any other strategies that you can kind of put in place to, to kind of deal with that? Yeah, data locality is uh, an important topic, but not only for uh, data privacy. So this is something we, we also considered from the very beginning in our architecture that data and processing is happening in a specific geographic region uh, because also for accounting purposes, there are restrictions that data must be stored in a certain geographical regions. This is as well a requirement and therefore you have to make sure and, and have to understand where is the data stored and processed and make sure that there is no data transfer if this is not allowed. And GDPR is very strict around this. I'm happy that we are now uh, at least very close to a new data privacy agreement with the US. I think it was signed now, but um, there is still uh, yeah, some uncertainty because uh, we don't know if, if this is a stable agreement or if we will uh, see a SREM3 or something like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so obviously a complex topic that's continuing to evolve over time. And that could actually be a barrier to organizations, data management strategies. It's just you have the right internal knowledge to deal with a lot of these data privacy issues and data regulations, right? So definitely something to keep in mind, probably from the beginning, as you begin to kind of launch your, uh, your data management strategy. And, um, you know, technology has made this a simpler, I guess, uh, task for organizations to undertake over time. We've kind of alluded to that with the advances in technology, cloud technology, data lakes, APIs, some of these other technologies we've mentioned here. And hopefully we'll continue to do so. But I mean, are there any particular technologies kind of emerging these days that organizations should keep their eyes on that might actually simplify their data management strategies? I mean... The, the whole topic about artificial intelligence and machine learning, I think 2023 is uh, is the year of the breakthrough of those technologies. And um, they are not just useful for analyzing data, and but also for, for managing the data. You can use AI ML to automate data quality control, uh, generate meta metadata based on a, on machine learning algorithms, but also to detect sensitive data. There are also services provided uh, to, for example, identify PII data in data sets, and with this support you in a complex topics such as data privacy. And as one part of AI ML, generative AI, I think it's the big topic of, of this year, triggered especially by by technology such as chat gpt but i think they will really change how how we interact with computers um the the traditional user interfaces they have their use cases and they will remain but also the option to to prompt with a uh, simple interface and with this uh, slice and dice through the data and, and get value out of, uh, of out of the system, create a talk report, um, generate text, images, media based on the data. I think this is also something very which is super interesting, especially for financial data, um, to get a new way of how you can interact with the systems and with this uh, gain insights into your um, financial data. Um, related to this as well, the, the use of 
AI to generate synthetic data. This is also something which supports especially companies as TIS to mitigate risks about data privacy so that you can assemble real data based on existing data in the system without um, threatening privacy. Um, this is something super interesting and uh, helping also to train uh, such AI and ML models. Yeah, synthetic data is definitely one that I'm interested in. And obviously it takes a lot of data to drive good analytics and not all companies have all that data, particularly historically and particularly with the, a lot of the systems architectures you've dealt with on-premise systems and limited data storage capabilities, limited data sharing capabilities. So to be able to create synthetic data that kind of accurately plugs some of those gaps in your data set is, uh, is definitely something that is, uh, is very exciting. Um, as are some of the technologies you mentioned before, like ChatGPT, I think anybody who's played around with that a little bit can clearly see the, uh, the uh, potential of that, of that technology. Um, but I think a few, a few people in the financial space are still a little bit skittish about it just because it's not fully regulated yet. So to give AI that kind of access to your financial information, your kind of sensitive financial application, people are a little uneasy about it at the moment. But, you know, uh, I think probably the regulations and things around that will probably catch up during the course of the year, too. Like you said, it's kind of like it seems like it's the year where those technologies are really going to come to fruition. We're really going to start to see some really good use cases, particularly for finance professionals around um ai and machine learning as well so yeah uh, this is a big trend we see already right now that the whole topic around uh backtracking to uh, get insights how were decisions made by the machine learning models and with this also address legal and compliance issues is a huge topic and we see uh, good developments there right now and Chat GPT, I think it's a, it's a great tool because it made AI ML so much available to the world. But on the other hand, it, it's based on public data. So especially when you think about financial data, uh, you need to have a system in place which is um, limited to your data and you need to make sure that you don't train an AI ML model on, based on your data because you don't want to um, yeah, create a data breach uh, just because you train an AI model unintendedly. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And the, and the use case that you mentioned there that kind of probably flies under the radar for most people is the ability for AI to kind of detect PII, you know, personally identifiable information for GDPR and, and data privacy regulations. That could seriously simplify, you know, the exercises that a lot of companies have to go through to make sure that they're compliantly storing data as well as part of their data management strategies too. So that's an interesting one. Definitely uh, kind of keeping my eye on here. So, and I know we kind of shot for you know 30 minute session here today. So maybe moving into a final kind of uh, call to action type point here. You know, if there are some practical suggestions you could make for companies that are just at the beginning of this journey of sort of evaluating their data management strategies, maybe you can give us a couple of those. You know, what would you kind of suggest for companies just launching this process now? Yeah, I think it, it first of all starts that you really need to assess your current state. So you have to understand what data do you need, what data do you already have at hand, what data you want to enrich with and where the data resides, who owns the data, and, and how you want to use the data to make, uh, yeah, and, and achieve your business goals. So I think this is where everything starts with. And based on this, you, you need to define your goals. You need to identify what are the key stakeholders, the business side, data analysts, data scientists, security, compliance. They need to be involved from the beginning. Uh, to build a proper data management strategy and uh, prioritize data governance. So have policies, ownership, data quality, metadata, data, their privacy and security defined from the very beginning. Adding this at a later stage is, is hard. So this is something you have to care about in the early phases and also invest into the right tools there are a lot of tools around, uh, evaluate them and make sure you use the right tools for the right job. They help you a lot. I think these are key assets and then develop a culture around data. So we mentioned it before, 
data is not just data. There are different uh, different priorities, different use cases, and you really have to understand which data is important, what are the retention policies, policies uh, you want to implement, and build a strategy around this, how you manage data and how you want to age data. This is, I think, the key. Mm -hmm. uh, some really good suggestions there, and I don't think there's much I could uh, really add to that. So thanks a lot for, uh, for those kind of call to action type items here. As we kind of reach the end of our session here, we definitely want to save some time for some Q&A. I have seen a couple questions pop into the questions box here. So maybe we'll bring Jen back up here to pick out a couple of the uh, the ones that seems like the audience was most interested in to ask to uh, myself and Florian. Yeah, thanks, John and Florian. We had a couple roll in. I'll focus on two of them just for uh, our time limitation here. The first one comes in from Mateo. Are there any risks to consider with storing more data and storing it all in a centralized location? Are companies more susceptible to data breaches and attacks from hackers? Um, so in general, the, if you just harvest uh, any data, there is always the risk of, or an increased risk of the data breach as well. And we also see um, development and good progress in the implementation of technology such as quantum computing and there is also with this the risk of uh, decrypting data which is considered today as being encrypted securely so because of this data minimization um, is key and just harvesting any kind of data is a risk and you should be really clear about what data you need great thank you so much florian the next question comes in from thomas is there any guidance you could give in terms of how much data companies need to have to take advantage of AI ML technologies? For example, one year or two years worth of data. Um, yeah, this this heavily depends on the use case. So we mentioned before ChatGPT, this is a so-called large language model where you benefit from as many data as possible so that the system gets trained on um, on all the information available from the past. But if you consider financial data, it, it depends, for example, considering a cash forecast, if your um, cash flow changes over time and you train your machine learning model based on a historic data, you might get um, results which are not expected. So with, with this, it's uh, worth to focus on the most recent data and derive your uh, derive your models and your um, recommendations based on the, on the recent data instead of historic data. So it heavily depends on the use case, and this again narrows down to understand your data, understand your targets, and with this make a decision how you uh, want to use and process data. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Florian. John, that's the end of the questions. All right, great. So I think that brings us here to the end of the session. Florian, once again, really enjoyed the conversation. So thanks a lot for uh, being, being a part of today's webinar.